I'm Eric. I am the youth pastor here at Aspire, and I just want to say I am delighted that you decided to join us this morning, this brisk, cold morning. I don't know about the rest of you. Any, anyone here, or was it just me? Any of the rest of you, like, walk out of the house this morning saying, I don't need a jacket. <laughs> Sun's out. It's great. And, and I don't know about you, but my wife was like, you need a jacket. I did not listen to her sage, wise counsel. So... I bought myself an Aspire sweatshirt, so it, we, we have them out here. If, you, if any of the rest of you walked out and realizing that's a little colder than you thought, out here at the Next Steps table, you can buy a nice sweatshirt. They're really quite warm, too, so that was a side note. wasn't intended, but it, it worked out well this morning, so want to say we're delighted you guys are here with us. If this is your first time, on the seat that you came in and you're sitting on, there was a card. It's a connection card. If this is your first time, we would love it if you would fill that out with some information about you, where you're from, how to contact you. It's our way of getting to know you a little bit more and at the same time, have a connection point where it, we can keep you up to date on anything that's happening here at Aspire. If you fill that card out and you take it to the next steps table right outside these doors, we have a gift for you. And it's just our way of just thanking you once again for joining us today. In addition, Next Sunday, how many of you know what next Sunday is? Easter, yes, and it is, it, I love Easter. And next Sunday, what we're, not only are we going to have a really awesome Easter service, but we're also going to be having some baptisms take place. Woohoo! Yes, we have, we have quite a few people signed up already, but if, if you haven't signed up and you would like to take part in the baptismal portion of that service, on your Next Steps card, just all you need to write is baptism and take it to the Next Steps table and we'll get you on the list because we would love to just, Brian has already said he would like continue to cut his message shorter and shorter based upon how many baptisms. I would love to see like nothing but baptisms the entire service. That would be awesome, right? Yeah. But I also wanted to let you know, invite your family or some friends next Sunday. We're going to have a photo booth set up. I mean, those of you who've been coming for a while know we love to do the photo booths where you can it's all decorated. You can take family pictures. Some of you, that might be the only time you get a family picture with all the family. So take advantage of that. And uh, again, we're next Sunday, Easter service, invite friends and family. And Friday, we're also going to have a good Friday service at 6.30 here. So that, and they're two complete different services. So I know sometimes we have people say, well, I'll go to one or the other. They're completely different. Good Friday service is going to be different than Easter Sunday service. So we'd love it if you were able to make it to both. So in addition to that, also just want to say in, on the envelope, on the seat that you sat on, we have our offering envelope. And um, if you brought your tithes and offerings, you can fill out the envelope. We have a basket on the table in the back here. You can put your tithes and offerings there. Or you can text Aspire Church to 77 977 and there will be a drop down giving menu there or you can go to our website and again uh, just want to let you know today Brian is not here today we have Pastor Glenn Elliott from Pantano here he is the, yes Pastor Glenn is the the former senior pastor at Pantano and he the way Brian always talks about them Glenn is a pastor to pastors he has an anointing to just pour out into other pastors and bless them tremendously. And he not only is he a great speaker, and I love hearing him preach, but he's also a friend of Brian's, and he's also a friend of Aspire. So we're going to continue to worship some more, and then Pastor Glenn is going to come up and share the message with you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be with you again. This is my second time. I got to preach here at Aspire, and uh, uh, next Sunday is Easter. It's coming. Yes. And uh, so we're going to take a break from the teaching series that we've been doing as we've been looking at 1 John. we we'll take a little break uh, as we prepare uh, and look towards uh, Easter. And uh, uh, we're going to look at, uh, at what uh, really began Jesus' last week of life on earth in this physical form that way and uh, leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. And we have services this week that are going to model that too with Good Friday, focusing on the crucifixion and, of course, Sunday uh, Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And uh, I hope that I'll help us uh, prepare for our Easter celebration as well. I, I want you to think uh, a moment about uh, an experience, an event, uh, you know, something where you knew a change was coming. 
okay? Um, you know, you're moving towards something, you're moving through a door, and you know that, that, that whatever is on the other side of that is going to be significant and consequential. Now, it could be a graduation, uh, could be maybe a new, starting a new job, moving to a new city, marriage, you know, that would be one of those things. And, and, uh, and, and that was one of them for me was marriage. Uh, I still remember uh, the night before I, our, our wedding, uh, I was uh, staying at my dad's house and I remember being in the room, laying on the bed and thinking, what am I about to do? And it wasn't cold feet, you know, it wasn't doubt. It was like, I just have no idea how this is going to play out, right? There's no guarantee here. It's just, you know, I just don't know what this is going to look like. And, and I can just remember laying there thinking about, man, this is a huge decision. Um, now, my wife who's here sitting over here, we've been married for 44 years, so it's been good. <laughs> been, uh, been tons of good. But as you can imagine, over 44 years, there's been sorrow, heartache, challenge, uh, no regrets, uh, but uh, 44 years ago, I had no idea how this was all going to play out, right? And uh, today we're looking at um, an event in Jesus' life that's called the triumphal entry. And, um, you know, Jesus is about, in this, in this moment in his life, he's about to face the most difficult and challenging week of his three years of ministry. And, uh, and this, this, this week is a, is a big deal in every way. In fact, it, it actually, the content of it takes up about half of our Gospels. And, and, and if you're new to, to, to faith, the Gospels are the four stories that are written in our Bible that tell the story of Jesus. And, and it's, this, this week is a huge part of that story. And so we're going to look at, at, at this, at how this begins. Now, one of the big differences between you and I and Jesus is... Um, it, it, it is this, that when you and I enter into that thing that's a big deal, you know, that this big change in life, we're going through this door where things could, you know, be significantly different on the other side, uh, like marriage, we don't know how things are going to turn out when, you know, when I was getting ready for, my, for that wedding, I didn't know how it was all going to play out afterwards, you know, but Jesus began this final week knowing exactly how things were going to turn out. He knew every detail. Now, I don't know about you. I mean, you know, I don't know what you think was harder. Is it harder to start something where you have no idea how it's actually going to play out? Or, or, or is it harder to start something where you would actually know how it's going to play out? I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think it's harder to know up front how things are going to play out. And particularly for Jesus, because he knew that this week would end in immense disappointment. He'd be betrayed, denied. They left him, his disciples. He would be tortured and he would be killed. And he knew that. He knew all the details of that. So here's how the last week of Jesus' life begins. We're going to look in Luke chapter 19. And if you need a Bible, we have Bibles on both sides here. Grab a Bible. And if you need to take one home, uh, we'd love for you to take that w as well. And uh, we're going to start in Luke chapter 19. Uh, we're going to start at verse 28. Luke 19, verse 28. And when he said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that Jesus always traveled by foot. And uh, we have a pretty good record in, in the Gospels, those four stories of Jesus uh, that, about his travels. And they've been able to estimate that he walked over 3,000 miles in his three years of ministry. 3,000 miles. I mean, you know, going up to Galilee, back to Jerusalem, all over, you know, uh, over 3,000 miles. And now he begins his final journey, and he's on an 18-mile uphill walk from Jericho to Jerusalem. And uh, I, I've been able to travel that road uh, on a bus. I didn't have to walk it on a bus. And, and I'm telling you, that journey from Jericho to Jerusalem, uh, it, it, it's a bleak, ugly, barren desert. It's not like our Sonoran Desert. You know, it's just, it's, it, it's ugly. Uh, 
And, and this journey for Jesus, it, it's a big deal because it's his final journey. He's walking towards the climax of his life and his story, which we call the good news. And what is about to transpire was all carefully planned. In fact, it had been prophesied about. It had been predicted 500 years before this actually happens. And so Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. Now, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 29. We'll continue here. It says, When he drew near Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he saw two of his disciples, He sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And when they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need need of it. So, so Jesus and his disciples, they're, they're near Bethany. Now Bethany is uh, where Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And when that happened, man, everybody knew about it. Man, word spread about that. That's what, this was a huge deal. And not only raising Lazarus from the dead, but all the other miracles that Jesus had done. And, and so Jesus was well known in this area, at least by name. Okay, the, uh, and some believed in him, obviously as well. And it was it was common in that day for a rabbi or some other person, a, a dignitary, if they were needing a, a, an animal to ride on, they could just procure it. And and uh, and it was so that wasn't particularly uh, unlikely. But I think in this case, it, it's very likely that Jesus sent his two disciples to the owners of this colt who actually knew who he was. We don't know that they believed in him. We don't know that he was, they were his followers, but at least they knew about him. Because w- when the disciples go up, they start untying the, t- the coal. They're ready to take it. They go, what are you doing? And they just said, the Lord has need of it. And that's all. They said, okay. They knew the Lord that they were referring to. They probably even maybe recognized the disciples. We don't know for sure. But that's why they let him take this coal. Now, Jesus told the disciples to get a colt in which no one had ever sat on. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I read this, I go, I don't know that that's a good idea. <laughs> now, I, I'm no expert, you know, with horses and, col- and donkeys and all that, but it, it just doesn't seem like you want to get a colt that no, nobody's ever ridden on. And here is Jesus, a grown adult man, going to sit on this Cold. I just don't think this is going to work out very well. You know, that, that, that's just kind of, that, that's just how I think about this. But anyway, I, I think there's a deeper meaning about what's going on here with Jesus asking for this cult that had never been ridden on. What we begin to see is there's a pattern of newness in this final week. Uh, from this moment, just seven days later, six days later, Jesus is going to be put into a tomb. He's put into a tomb that no one had ever been laid in. It's brand new. This colt had never been ridden on. And and I think this is the the meaning that's part, part of this is that what Jesus is doing here in this final week of his life, he is launching something that is incredibly new and incredibly big and important and it will change everything. What, what, What he's doing is he's launching a new thing. It's a new kingdom. He's creating a new covenant. You know, on the night before he's arrested, you know, he he says that I'm launching. Is 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 he doing communion with him? He says I'm launching a new covenant, and 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 it's a new way of living, and he's forming a new community, which will be the church. And, And the point is that something new and big is about to happen. And so we pick up the story again in Luke chapter 19, verse 35. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God uh, with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had, uh, had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, this was Passover. This is the 
biggest holiday, the Jewish holiday. And not only was it just a big holiday, but it was, it was just really an important thing for people to come to Jerusalem. And so there were all of these pilgrims that had filled the city. And there were crowds and crowds of people, many of which who were aware of Jesus and were actually already following Jesus and had really become, come to believe in him. And, and, and this crowd especially those who had heard and known about Jesus, and Jesus was well known by this point, was that they were, they were expectant. They, they badly wanted a Messiah. They were looking for that. They were hoping for that. They were anticipating it. And, and so they were jubilant. And there's this powerful mood of anticipation. And, and, and this was sort of Jesus' red carpet experience as he's going into Jerusalem. Now, the triumphal entry was, it fulfills a prophecy I mentioned in, in Zechariah 9.9. 9. Uh, but, but it's more than a prediction. It's more than a fulfilled prophecy. Jesus enters Jer Jerusalem in a way where he's making a statement. And uh, Andre, you, you kind of alluded to that uh, earlier. You see, the disciples and the crowds were expecting a Messiah. But their perspective of a Messiah is that the Messiah was this warrior king. And he was going to enter Jerusalem to conquer the Romans. And a warrior king, how would they enter Jerusalem? On a war horse, probably with a sword. How does Jesus enter Jerusalem? On a donkey, a colt. No warrior king would ever enter Jerusalem on a colt. That just, that, that just, that, that's not the way it is. Jesus is making a statement. He's not a military king. He's the prince of peace, riding a donkey. He comes as a humble king who in less than a week will sacrifice his life. He's a loving servant king. And so even though it's strange for him to enter Jerusalem, the Messiah on a donkey. The disciples and the crowds, they still see him as a king and they give him the royal treatment. When they lay down their cloaks uh, uh, before the donkey as they're entering in, that reckons back to at least two other times in the Old Testament when, when the kings of Israel entered Jerusalem and the crowds did that. And so this was, everybody was saying that they're welcoming the king in, in, into Jerusalem. And, and as we know, today is also called Palm Sunday. In, in the other gospels, it also mentions that they would lay down palm branches as well as he was entering in. Uh, but not everybody welcomed Jesus. We continue in, in, in chapter 19, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered them, I tell you, that if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The, the, the Pharisees were incensed by the celebration. See, they had already rejected Jesus as the Messiah. They, they believed that he was a fraud who had fooled this, all of this crowd of people and, and, and duped these simpletons. And now these uneducated people should be silenced. That, that was the, the attitude of these religious leaders. But Jesus tells them that if the crowds were quiet, creation itself would announce who he is. And I think this is one of several times, and I don't have time to show you the others, but especially with the Pharisees, that Jesus would use humor as a way to dig. <laughs> it, 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 here's what I think he's saying. Jesus is saying, look, Pharisees, you don't know who I am, but the stones do. And you're dumber than a stone. Okay, maybe it's possible. As Jesus gets closer to the city, we pick up the story. Again, Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you 
because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus knows that the excitement of the celebration of his entry is going to fade and it'll end up, most of the people will end up rejecting him. The rejection of the Messiah will lead them down a path of destruction. And Jesus weeps. The word for weep is a strong word. It's a word for sobbing out loud. It describes someone whose chest is heaving with that immense sadness and grief. Jesus is in agony. And I don't want you to miss the depth of what Jesus felt in this moment. The crowds are celebrating him. And he's weeping openly. Jesus, in that moment, chose not to ignore or numb the pain that he was feeling. He didn't hide it. He let it out for all to see. And I want to ask you the question, why did he want to, us to see and know about his weeping in that moment? Why? Why this demonstration of deep emotion? I think Jesus wants us to see how he felt because he wants us to be like him. I think he wanted us to see this profound depth of emotion because it's actually to be a part of who we are to be as we follow Jesus, as we, as disciples. Because the whole idea of being a disciple is that we're to become like Jesus. And I want to unpack this a little more. You see, he's in agony because he knows that all of these masses of people are going to reject him as the true king. And he knows that these people whom he loves are going to suffer greatly. In fact, in just 40 years, we know, after Jesus said this, the Romans surrounded Jerusalem. They laid siege. It was a long siege. Many people died of starvation. Many people were killed by the Roman soldiers. When they finally breached the walls of Jerusalem, they destroyed everything, they, including the temple. They, they leveled it. It was absolute destruction and in the, the worst way. But more than, the, than that, I, I, I think there's, there's even more that caused this excruciating pain in Jesus. And that's that they knew that they were rejecting the Messiah. They were choosing an eternity apart from God. Jesus is weeping over their brokenness, their hard-heartedness, their rejection of God who was visiting them. See, Jesus was sent by God. Jesus is God, and that's who they were rejecting. And Jesus' heart's broken by the decisions that they, some have already made and, and, some, and that some will make. And I don't think it's any different right now for Jesus. I think Jesus still weeps. His heart's broken by any and all who, who choose to ignore him, dismiss him, reject him. And, and you know what? That happens, that, that rejection, that, that dismissing of Jesus, that happens both inside the church and outside the church. It's not just outside and his heart's broken because his love is so strong. It's, it's so profoundly deep that when anyone chooses not to accept him as the true God, as the true Messiah, as the Christ, it breaks his heart. A, a, a true intimate relationship is what he wants with every human being. And when that's broken, it's devastating to him. And so he grieves. He grieves over you. He grieves over me when we pull away from him. And his love is so strong that, that anything that we've done to, to distance ourselves from him just causes him that intense pain because of that incredible love that he has for us. He's weeping over some of you. 
He's weeping over some of your family and friends, people you work with, people you go to school with. And he's weeping out of that profound, deep love. I've been working on this message for a, a few weeks. First, I start just by studying it, trying to understand it. Then I pray about it, asking God, God, what, what do you want? What's the message that you want from this? And then I've spent a lot of time reflecting on it. And, and, and here's where I've landed. I believe we're told about Jesus weeping, his sobbing for this reason. Jesus invites us to be like him. We're to be like him. That's what a disciple is. And as a disciple of Jesus, we're to be shaped and formed to become more and more like him in our character, in our beliefs, in our words, in our actions. See, Jesus wants us to see what he sees and he wants us to feel what he feels. And if we will see what Jesus sees and if we will feel what he feels, that is critical for us to become more like him. We'll never become like him till we see what he sees and feel what he feels. Okay? So here's the challenge I have for you, and this is the challenge for myself as well. Are you ready? I'm asking you to sincerely pray this simple but profound prayer. Jesus, let me see and feel what you see and feel. Jesus, let me see and feel what you see and feel. And, and I believe this, this story was recorded, by the way, in all four Gospels because the Spirit wants us to see what Jesus saw and to feel what he feels. This is how Jesus began his final week. But there's another event that was near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It kind of bookends his, his life that communicates the same message, just in a different way. And I want us to look at that so that we can continue to get this glimpse of what Jesus saw and what he felt. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Okay, that's what he did. There, there you have a summary of Jesus' ministry. He went everywhere he could, teaching about the kingdom of God, and he was healing people and, and doing miraculous things. Okay, that's, that's a great summary of Jesus' life and ministry. Verse 36. Remember, we're talking about what did Jesus see? What did he feel? When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Now, Everywhere Jesus goes, he's talking about the kingdom of God. He's healing people. He's doing miracles. That's what he did. But what did Jesus see? He saw the crowds, but he just didn't see them as a crowd. He saw them like sheep. What? Without a shepherd. And then he used two words to describe those sheep without a shepherd. They were harassed and what? Helpless. Those two words in the original language were words used for animals. The word harassed describes an animal whose skin is being ripped off by a predator. So here's this sheep, this crowd of people, this is what Jesus sees, who are like sheep who are getting their, their skin ripped off of them by the evil one because there's no shepherd to protect them. And, and they're helpless. That word helpless is, describes an animal who either has a wound or a broken limb and can't escape when the predator comes. 
And so he sees all of these people who have no spiritual shepherd to protect them and their lives are being ripped up and destroyed by the evil one. That's what he sees. And what does he feel? Says he had compassion. Now, to be honest, I, I don't like how that was translated. That's an accurate translation. But, but, but think about it. Jesus sees the sheep, the, the sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless, and he had compassion. And what do we think? Oh, that's nice. Jesus cares about people. No, this word compassion, by the way, I love, it. I love how it's, it's pronounced in Greek, splachna. You know what the word splachna, compassion, means? It literally means your gut, your bowels. That word bowels is translated here, compassion. But it, it misses the intensity of what's being described. That when Jesus saw the crowd, sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless, their lives are being destroyed, it hit him in the gut. It made him bend over. He felt what he saw. He saw these people in incredible need. And it doubled him over. It, it affected him that way. This is, this is how Jesus begins his ministry. He is filled with compassion for what he sees. In the last week of his life, as he's entering Jerusalem, he sees the people, the crowds, and he weeps. What Jesus is saying to us is, Look, this is what I see. This is what I feel. And then what did he say to the, He said, look, I want you to pray. Because the harvest is plentiful. We need people to go out and tell the sheep that they have a shepherd who can save them, who can protect them, who can keep them from their lives being destroyed by the evil one. He wants us to be involved in the work that he's doing. So he's inviting us to pray this prayer. Jesus, let me see and feel what you see and feel. I, I, I want to be more like Jesus. I, I hope that you're here because you want to be more like Jesus as well. A, a few years ago, God really laid it on my heart uh, th with this very sense that, that, that I started asking the question, God, how do you see my neighborhood? We have 40 homes in our neighborhood. I actually know the names of all, of all my neighbors. I don't know them well, but I know the names of our neighbors. God, Jesus, how do, you look, how do you see my neighbors? What do you feel? And, and that led me up praying this very prayer, God, help me to see and feel what you see and feel. And so I began to pray that God would lead me to one neighbor that I could ultimately share about Jesus with. And, and I'll be honest, it, it was months and months and months of prayer, and I didn't see anything happening. And then uh, there was this one situation where we were doing a cleanup in our neighborhood, and so I asked for people to come and help do the cleanup, and one person showed up, Andy. Andy. So Andy and I did the cleanup, and after we were done, we had a chance to get a little better acquainted, and he, he told me that he had just retired, and, uh, and, and then, he, then he asked me the question that I always hate when people ask me. They go, what did you do? Because when I tell them I'm a pastor, it usually shuts down the conversation, and you know, it's, you know, see you later, you know. I told him I was a pastor, and he said, really? I said, yeah. And he said, you know, now that I'm retired... I actually have time and I've started reading the Bible and I don't understand a thing I'm reading. He started in Genesis. He made it through Leviticus. He was he just almost to the New Testament. And he goes, I don't get what's going on. He'd never been to church. He'd never read the Bible, which by the way is very common in Tucson. More common than you would be, be, probably be, likely be aware. And so... At that moment, I said, well, w would you like help understanding it? And he was very depreciative. He said, yes. And so what we began doing was we just took some of the key stories of the Bible. We didn't 
try to do the whole Bible, just key stories. Some of the, like the story of creation and, and with Abraham and, you know, and, just, and we just would read a story and, 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 and I'm telling it in this way because this, what I did with him is what any of us could do. You don't have to be a pastor to do this. We just read a story and said, what do you think this means? He would share what he thought he meant. I would share what I thought we meant. And we did that. We did this for over a year. And then uh, when, we, when we kind of did through the major stories of the, of the Bible, we, uh, we, we, together we watched a, a program that's online. It's called Alpha Course. Alpha Course is 10 weeks and you, can, you have access to it. It's designed to help people who, are, who have no faith to, to discover who Jesus is. So we did the Alpha Course together. Then after that, we did a, a, a book on discipleship. It's called Rooted. It doesn't matter what you use. We just, I just, we, we just, folks, that took three years. Three years. Now, during that three years, Andy slowly began to trust the Bible. He began to trust God. He began to trust me. And it was just a year ago this spring that Andy called me up and says, hey, I, I, I'm ready to accept Jesus and I'd like to be baptized. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, God did all that. God did all that. He had already been at work in Andy's life. And I just prayed, God, lead me. And, and God orchestrated it. He created the opportunities. He made it happen. And, 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 I'm, and I'm saying this to say, look, this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to see people like he sees them. He wants us to feel what he feels for people. And when we see and feel like Jesus sees and feels, God will open doors and opportunities for us to be able to let them know that they have a shepherd who loves them and can, can keep them from the evil one destroying their lives. Now look, I'm, I'm not your pastor and I don't know a lot of you personally, but I think I have a pretty good pulse of the church in Tucson because uh, I work with a lot of churches, a lot of pastors, and here's what I see. I, I think we in the church, and when I say the church, I don't just mean Aspire, I mean the church in our city all different kinds of churches. I don't think we see and feel what Jesus sees and feels. Jesus weeps over Tucson. Jesus weeps over the foothills. He sees people's lives being destroyed. And it, the pain is incredible there. And so why do we as the church not see and feel what Jesus does? I, I, I'm going to give you my, my theory. I don't think we want to engage the pain that Jesus felt. He, here's what I know about human nature. This, this isn't theory. This is fact. We hate pain. We'll do whatever we can to avoid it. We will numb it. We numb it with shopping. We numb it with gaming. We numb it with, with streaming. We numb it with whatever. Alcohol, drugs, we'll find some way to numb it. Be being busy, being successful, we'll find a way to numb the pain. We hate pain. We think it's bad. I could do a whole sermon series on this, but we don't have time for that. Okay, but, but I know that that's true. And so we just follow this pattern in all aspects of life, but we also do it in the spiritual realm as too. That if we really saw people as Jesus sees them and as we really felt the way he felt, it would be painful. I believe it would cause us to move into action, but it's painful and we would rather avoid that. So, so my challenge is this. It, it, it's to pray the prayer that I ask you to pray. Jesus, let me see and feel what you see and feel. It might be the most risky prayer you ever pray. Asking God to show you one person. To let you see that one person the way he sees them. To feel the way he feels about that one person. You're Andy. 
your Mary, whoever it might be. It could be somebody in your family. It could be somebody you work with, go to school with. It could be a neighbor. Asking God to help you feel what he feels and then weeping over their spiritual condition. May I just encourage you not to avoid those difficult feelings. May what you and I see and feel move us to engage that one. Who's that one person Jesus wants you to see? Who's that one person he wants you to feel deeply about? May I encourage you just to, even right now, just open your heart to say, Jesus, who is that? In fact, I bet some of you right now have a name in mind. Fix that name in your brain. Start praying about them. Because where we begin with this is prayer. God, you work in their lives. Your spirit begins to work in their heart. Your spirit begins to create opportunities. And as we have that, 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 the vision that Jesus has, we begin to see God opening doors in ways that we would have never anticipated or expected. May I just encourage you to refuse to, to just refuse to, to, to numb or rationalize, rationalize away those feelings, those painful feelings about people's true spiritual condition, about their condition apart from Christ. And with Easter coming, maybe this is even a time to invite that person to join you for church. It could be an incredible opportunity. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He weeps over Tucson. He weeps over your neighborhood, your work, your school, your family. His heart is still broken and he still weeps. And if we're to be shaped and formed to be like Jesus, we have to have a heart that's broken and that weeps over people who are separated from life. And so I am inviting you to pray. Jesus. Let me see and feel what you see and feel. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for loving us. None of us have deserved your love and your grace, but you've loved us deeply. And you see how people around us in our lives are being ripped apart by the evil one. who are being destroyed and and they're separated from you and they're alone from in this relationship with you now. And, and not only now, but it will be for eternity. And so God, give us your eyes. Give us your heart to see and feel what you see and feel. And use us to introduce others to a shepherd who loves them, who can protect them and give them life. In Jesus' name, amen.